Okay, Wilson and Middle School, we're going to get things started here in just a couple of seconds. Um, thank you guys for getting down to the gym on time. Thank you guys for uh, being prepared to, to head outside. I think the weather is looking a little bit nicer than, than maybe we had thought, so that's a good thing. Uh, I think uh, our homeroom teachers have all talked to you guys about why we're here today, and that's obviously uh, to celebrate uh, Terry Fox Day. So, uh, over 8,500 8, schools across Canada, that's 3 million students in our country, are celebrating today fundraising for cancer for cancer research in Terry's name. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, so today we get to celebrate the life of Terry Fox, his marathon of hope, and to show our school community and our very own school Terry Fox run. So it's a really special day here at Wilson Middle School, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, a little background is, if you guys uh, didn't already know, Terry began his marathon of hope back in 1980. So 1980 is older than Mr. Davenport and a lot of the teachers on staff, but not all the teachers on staff. Um, Terry wasn't a great athlete growing up. He played sports, but he wasn't a great athlete. But he did run a marathon every single day. That's 42 kilometers every single day during his run when he was running. Today, we're going to run roughly two kilometers. Put that into perspective. We're going to do two kilometers a day. He did 42 every single day for 143 days. And while he was doing that, he was feeling lots of pain in his leg. He would run through all types of bad weather. And today, we're going to do two kilometers in nice weather. So uh, the thing that he was able to accomplish is absolutely amazing. Uh, his goal was to raise one dollar from every Canadian, and with the help of Canadians everywhere, his dream was realized and his marathon goal raised twenty-four million dollars in the first year. And now, after thirty-nine years, it's raised over seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Unbelievable. We're going to show you guys a quick video here about uh, Terry Fox, what he was able, what he was able to accomplish, and what we're kind of celebrating today. And then we can do a video for the two events or guests here today. Okay, well, let's watch this video, and then we'll get things moving. Okay. Today, he's 61 years old. 
which is probably around the same age as some of your grandparents. And so um, that, that story, I know some books, you always see kind of grainy video and whatnot, but it really wasn't very long whether that all took place. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I definitely want to speak uh, more about Terry Fox this morning as that's why we're here today. The impact he's had on me, on you, on maybe some of your family members and just our general community and, and country of Canada, across the world really. Um, and we're here to celebrate that, but more, not more, but um, we're also here to celebrate the fact that I was able to do my hair for the first time in about three and a half, four months. <laughs> treatments that I've had uh, fairly recently, so it's kind of neat to be able to put some product in my hair and look uh, somewhat normal again. But it feels good to be back at Wilson Middle School. Um, for those, I know most of the sevens and eights, some of the sixes, maybe you remember me, maybe you don't. Myself and, and Miss Lowski came around to some of your feeder schools back in the spring to uh, tell you a little bit about our wonderful school. So maybe that helps ring a bell, but my name is Mr. Gersh. Um, as Mr. Davenport said already, and I've been the vice principal of the school for the past five or six years, and before that I taught here for about ten years, so I've been here for a long time, longer than most of you have been alive. And um, so hopefully that helps you out a bit. But I've actually, uh, I've never been, this is a different circumstance, I've never been in front of a crowd talking about something other than a fundraiser or anything else to do with our school, so. I'm going to apologize in advance if I get up, you know, a little emotional because it's been kind of a crazy few months. So as I said, I'm going to talk a little bit today about Terry Fox, but also about my story as well. I think it's uh, nice for you to hear my story so you understand where I'm coming from as well. So when I do return back to school and I'm feeling better, you kind of know a little bit about what I've been going through. So as uh, I'm sure you picked up on, I've been kind of fighting this nasty disease of cancer for the past several months. And um, my intention today is definitely not to put myself on the same level as Terry Fox. I don't want to be misconstrued in any way. Um, I would never ever uh, put myself on that level. Um, and my intention is also not to scare anybody here today with my own personal story, but it's a real story. I think it's important to hear that real story. Um, and I'm going to end my talk today with a little bit of a challenge. So first of all, I'm going to speak about Terry Fox and show him um, the respect that he definitely deserves is that's why we're here today. What a story, what an incredible human being. As you saw in the video, he not only, um, you know, ran a marathon, which is an incredible feat in itself. Not many people are even able to do that, but he ran a marathon every day. And furthermore, he ran it on essentially one leg. And that leg was in a time where technology really wasn't, you know, you see, I'm sure you've seen the guy that sprints with the blade on the I mean, the technology wasn't there. He was, he was running, as I said in the video, on a cross-sack leg that's meant for walking, not running. He ran in small crowds, a great deal of pain, and uh, bad weather, people running him off the road, all sorts of, of uh, difficult situations, but he didn't quit. And it didn't deter him from, from continuing his mission, as you saw in the video. Why? What was it that made Terry Fox so special? What were the qualities that got through this? What can we learn from Terry Fox? For the answer to some of those questions, we kind of need to dig a little bit deeper and look at who Terry Fox was before illness hit him. Did he wake up one day and become superhuman? I don't think so. By all accounts, prior to being diagnosed with cancer, Terry Fox was uh, a fairly normal young man. As Mr. Davenport said, he was athletic growing up, but he wasn't the most gifted athlete. He loved to play soccer, rugby, baseball, but most of all basketball. But he, he wasn't the most gifted basketball player, as I said. But he's passionate about it. And so it's documented that in grade 8, which is the same age as some of you, a little different time, wasn't equal playing time, he saw one minute of playing time in his grade 8 basketball year. That would be enough to make most of us probably not enjoy the sport very much if he'd even quit. But Terry Fox wasn't a quitter. And so what did he do? He worked hard on his game. And by grade nine, he saw some more playing time. And by grade 10, he was a starter. And by the end of grade 12, because he worked and he worked and he worked on his game, he was, he was dedicated and he persevered. 
and by grade 12 and graduation, he was the athlete of the year in his high school. I love stories like that. Michael Jordan's story is similar to that. And Michael Jordan, by the way, isn't just the avatar that you see on some of your shoes and your shirt. He's a very real person, too. So you guys do your homework on him. But his, his story is somewhat similar to that. But anyhow, well, again, what can we learn from that? We learned that Terry Fox is determined. He knew he had to put the work in to get what he wanted. He was willing to take on challenges, and he wasn't willing to let his, the opinion of somebody else, others, uh, kick him down and, and prevent him from doing something he wanted to do. Despite poor odds, he turned a tough situation into a great story in his life. We call this perseverance. We call it resiliency. He was courageous, willing to take battles head on. He didn't quit. Where else do we see and hear about these qualities? The Wilson Way. And why are we talking about these things with the Wilson Way? Because those are the qualities that make great people. And you need to think about that. So perhaps this was just a foreshadowing for what was to later transpire in his life. Maybe this was preparing him for becoming a legend we all know today. Maybe it was destiny. Wasn't this similar to Marathon of Hope? You don't think for a second that Terry Fox had doubters? When he had his leg amputated and he told people he's going to run across Canada? Of course he did. But again, he didn't let doubters stop him. Determination, perseverance, resiliency, courage, work ethic. Let these be the first takeaways from this story. So now, with the next chapter of Terry's life at age 18, I don't know how many of you know this, but he was driving home to see his family when he was involved in a minor car crash. He walked away with a sore knee. Four months later, I believe that was in the month of November, in the month of March, he finally went back to his doctor because his knee was still sore. And they ran some tests, and they found out that his knee was sore because he had cancer in his leg. And it was osteosarcoma, as you heard in the video, to be exact, which is a form of bone cancer. And it's in the same spot where he injured his, his knee in that accident. It was during his treatments and, and stay in the hospital that he became discouraged with the lack of information and research on cancer. He was in the pediatrics unit, which is where the children, sick children are. And this really ate him up. It was then that he decided he was going to do something about this. This was a display of empathy, another key word, for others. And since he was a person of action and he was a motiv motivated individual, he wanted to do something. Again, these are qualities that we talk about with the Wilson Wing. And qualities, more importantly, that make successful people. Can you imagine being told at the age of 18 or 19 that you had cancer and that they were going to have to amputate your leg? There really is no greater adversity in life that one could encounter. He had every reason to sit around and pout, feel sorry for himself, but he didn't. And everybody deals with adversity a little bit differently. So based on what we talked about earlier, this is why I told, told a little bit of background on Terry Fox, and I'm sure we've all heard it before, but we shouldn't be maybe surprised that Terry Fox faced this adversity head on, should we? He was determined to make a bad situation good. And these are the characteristics that made a once ordinary person into an extraordinary person. He made up his mind to do something to create change in the world, and that's what he did. He trained for 14 months and secured sponsors at that time. And on April 12, 1980, I was two years old at the time. I'm dating myself, I get that. He started the Marathon of Hope. Terry wasn't trying to use his unfortunate diagnosis as a springboard to celebrity status. And to the contrary, he was trying to use this unfortunate situation as making the, the disease, which is terrible, cancer famous and raise the awareness of cancer, raise money for cancer so that others would have to deal with things that he had to deal with. So as you saw in the video, when he first started this hope, essentially by the solitude, running by himself and his best friend following behind and eventually his campaign started to pick up steam and there were people on the road cheering him on and football games, but that didn't happen until much later in that marathon of hope. But again, he persevered. He kept going because he knew he had this vision in his head that he wanted to, of what he wanted to achieve, and he had goals. 
And so he kept going. And so as I said in the video, $24 million, one dollar for every Canadian was his goal in that uh, marathon of hope. Which now with inflation, we're up to a toonie instead of a loonie. Loonies weren't even around back then. But anyhow, so that's why we asked you to bring in those toonies. And after almost 40 years, it's raised nearly a billion dollars. Where does that money go? I'm going to come back to that. We know it goes to cancer, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more specifically in a minute. So now on my story. As I mentioned earlier, there are some similarities between our two stories. Terry loved to play sports, so do I. It was because of Terry's love for sport and desire to work with young children that he wanted and he aspired at the time of his illness to become a phys ed teacher. And again, I don't know how many of you know that, but I taught phys ed for over 10 years. So a little bit of a similarity there. Terry faced adversity in sport, as I'm sure I and everybody else that plays sports will at some point. And Terry, uh, Terry's cancer was the result of a blow to his knee. And that brings me to my story. So, I was skiing with my family in February of this year. So we're talking quite recently. And I had a little fall on some rocks. And um, I had hurt my hip, my butt, which is an uncommon place to fall if you've uh, ever been skiing. And to be honest, it really didn't bother me that much. In fact, I was probably more upset at the fact that I ripped my ski coat and I hurt my elbow more than my hip. But the next day I woke up with some swelling right underneath my butt and it kind of got bigger and more sore so I went to the doctor and uh, the doctor told me, well you probably have a hematoma which is like a bruise, a bad bruise in my hip. So I didn't think much of it because I kind of looked at Dr. Google and Dr. Google told me sometimes those things can take a while to heal. So you ice it, you elevate it, you take care of it. And uh, I didn't think much about it. In April, uh, March, I went back uh, to some healthcare providers and I was getting some major treatments. They sent me for an x-ray to make sure that uh, that hematoma wasn't calcifying. And the x-rays came back showing I had a little something in my leg they weren't sure to give me a hematoma, so I didn't think much of it. And then I went on a holiday over the Easter break with my wife, and ironically enough, is the first time that we've gone away for together in 19 years. So it's kind of weird how that happens. It's kind of spooky, to be honest with you. And we had a nice time on our holiday, but during that time, I started to get more symptoms. I was starting to sweat in my sleep and not feel quite as good. So when I got back from my holiday, I went back to the doctor and I said, something's up. We need to, we need to look a little deeper into this. So he said he's going to send me for an ultrasound, which is another scan of my leg. And I got a phone call saying it's going to be two weeks for that ultrasound. So I said, don't bother, because it's sore. So the one day in May, it was May 6th to be exact, I told Mr. Hawkins and Ms. Solowski and some others, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to be hanging here today and I'm going to go into emergency. So I went into the hospital, again May 6th, so that wasn't very long ago. And again, oddly enough, it's weird how sometimes things happen in the world, but my brother-in-law was in there that day and he was working in emergency training to be an EMT. And so the night before, I kind of made some jokes and I said, I got this big lump in my leg and they're going to cut it open and there's going to be blood squirting out. And I looked at some of these gross YouTube videos that some of us look at. Some, and I had this big, and I had my brother-in-law was going to video this hematoma being cut open. Well, it didn't work out that way. And uh, so that's when everything changed in my life. The doctor did the ultrasound, and um, and and um, I could tell on his face and by his expressions that something wasn't right immediately. And he said, and I'll never forget, he said, I don't know what's going on here with your leg, but we're going to find out. Do I have permission to keep you here and take care of you and find out? And I said, well, yeah, of course. So again, I, I just knew that something wasn't, wasn't quite right. 
and my brother-in-law knew too, so he kind of let me be. And for anybody that's ever been in an emergency, it's a busy place, and it's a kind of a, those rooms can kind of be lonely when you're sitting there for hours and hours, but lots of time to think. And I spent the rest of the day getting tests in my body, CT scans, blood tests, x-rays. Next day I came back, and they did an MRI, all these different tests, and then I met with the doctor again. And the doctor told me, I'm sorry to tell you, but I think you have what's called a malignant tumor in your leg, which is cancer. And it was just pretty crazy. Cancer. And I was devastated. And I had all these things going through my head. How was I going to tell my wife? What was I going to tell my parents? What would I tell my kids? What would I tell people at work? What would I tell you guys who I care about? And I had people calling me because I was away from work for a few days and I don't like to lie, but I didn't want to say too much at that point. So two days later, things really progressed quite quickly. I was up in Calgary just like that and they were taking a little chunk out of my leg to see what was going on. And I had to wait two weeks for those results. And those were the, probably, at that point, two of the longest weeks of my life. But then as I was at work here one day, sitting in my office with Mr. Hawkins, I got a phone call and it was the doctor in Calgary and he said, I'm sorry to tell you, but you in fact do have cancer in your leg. Crazy. Again, so many thoughts, so many questions. How do I have cancer in my leg? I've always been athletic. I've always taken care of my body. I don't want to lose everything that I've worked for. I have two incredible boys who are with me here today, an awesome wife, a great life, a great career, and I worked hard for all this. How can this be taken away from me? And I've always been a thinker. I've been a planner. I set goals. And kind of all that got put aside. That's tough. Everything was screwed up. And I didn't want to lose everything. So again, probably the hardest moment of my life. Not probably, it was, bar none. So it turned out the cancer I was diagnosed uh, with was big, it was aggressive, about the size of a softball in my leg. And uh, it was similar to the type of cancer that Terry Fox had. He had an osteosarcoma that was in his bone in his leg. Mine was in my, my, uh, led my muscles in my leg, and it was called a liposarcoma. They're very, both very rare. About 1% of all cancers are sarcomas, and they're not the result of a poor lifestyle, they're not passed down genetically, simply caused by a mutation of cells. And my body went to repair itself from that little fall I had. And I've had lots of games playing sports and whatnot over the course of my life, so again, more questions, why me? Why now? And unfortunately those questions will never probably be answered and it wasn't fair. Three weeks after that, I was back in Calgary for the start of my cancer treatments. So this is June now, June 4th. Not that long ago. You guys were finishing up for the, the school year. And they started doing chemotherapy, which is why I told you I lost in my hair. And they did that for a week and then they started doing some radiation treatments. All the hope of trying to kill this tumor and prevent it from spreading. So things were getting pretty real. And then this summer, I had the surgery to remove the tumor. And at that time, the surgeons told me that they were probably going to have to remove a little piece of my leg. And they figured at the time, probably about half of my glute, which is like your butt, right? And part of my hamstring, which is another big muscle in the back of your leg. And again, you know, I'm athletic, I like sports, I like to be active. That's a tough pill to swallow. So fortunately, when I woke up from surgery, I saw my wife and my family, and they were excited to tell me that um, they didn't have to take out quite as much of my leg as they thought they would. But all these questions, right? Would I walk? Would I be able to play again? Would I, be able, would I walk with a limit? Would I be able to walk at all? I mean, I didn't know. 
So then they had to wait another two weeks to get the results back from that uh, surgery. And if I thought the, the two weeks I talked about earlier were a long time, this one seemed like an eternity. So I've been in lots of nerve-wracking situations in my life, but nothing compares to the uh, follow-up meeting that I had in August with the surgeon. Thankfully that day, we got good news with my wife and I and our family. But the doctors quickly got all the cancer out of my body and that I would make a full recovery. So now I go back to Terry Fox the movement he created, the money, the awareness, and the result, which was the result of the Marathon of Hope. What would my prognosis have been without Terry Fox's quest? If this was 1980, it probably wouldn't have been good. My leg would probably have been gone. Would I worry more that it would come back and cause more damage? Absolutely. As I said in the video, just a few years before Terry Fox's cancer, he had probably about a 30% chance of living. In 1980s, up to 50%. Today, there's still very little information about uh, sarcomas because of how rare they are. And we know that they're not always fair, they affect young and old people like they hold no biases. But due to advances in research and technology, much of the as Terry Fox and his foundation, Survival rates are now up to about 80%. And I, I probably would have had about a 90% chance of losing my leg, as I told you back in, in 1980. So for that, I literally have Terry Fox to thank for my leg and for my life. It has given me more time than my family and friends, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. So before I close, I told you I was going to challenge you to leave you some thoughts. We all face adversity in our lives. Some are young people, some are old people. And there are people in here that have had significant challenges in your life. But what will your response be in those tough times? How will you react? You can't quit, can you? It brings me back to a quote I first heard from a hockey coach when I was 16 years old, and he said, you know, 10% of your life is going to be things that happen to you. The other 96% uh, of your life is going to be spent with how you react to those situations of that adversity. And I didn't really comprehend that, but I thought about it a lot, because it's deep stuff. But I'm challenging you to not ever forget that. You need to really think about it and let that sink in. Because they say that how you respond, respond in times of adversity will show you colors. I'm most definitely not perfect, but I've tried hard to handle myself with dignity and courage in the past five or six months. But it's been a challenge both physically and mentally. And there's lots of challenges to come yet. I have an incredible amount of motivation sitting in front of me today with you. But over here with my family, my wife, my kids, my mother, my friends, that's all motivation for me. And I plan to give it all to God to come out on top of this. To this day, I truly haven't thanked people enough. We've had people bring us meals, gift cards, money. We've had people cut our lawn. A friend of mine created these dirty, strong bracelets. Maybe some of you have them. We've had moments where I've been walking around the town, and hockey rings and stuff with my son, and I said, do you know that boy? No, and he's wearing a bracelet. That's pretty, so that's pretty cool. So according to Carter, my son, the thing kind of went viral, but anyways. Um, we had somebody pay for a grass to get cut this summer until I told them, no, we're good. I've got a 13-year-old lawnmower, and his name is Carter, so we're good there. We've had family and friends drive me to appointments in Calgary, where most of my treatments were done. But most importantly, we've had countless family and friends check up on us. And again, I'm, I'll be grateful forever for that. I literally have the best family, the best friends, the best neighbors, and the best staff and students to work with in my life. But I want to thank one person more than Then others, that's my wife. So, because she's been there with a smile on her face and positive attitude since day one. And that's who she is. She's been my rock and she's done everything from chauffeur me around to change bandages on my leg. And it's been just as hard on her and my family. So 
thank you very much. So, in closure, I challenge you to be good to others, and they too will be there in times of need. Be a good person. Live life to the fullest, but take care of yourself and others. Learn to work through and persevere adversity in your life. Because it's not if you're going to face adversity, it's when. And that's where the 10% versus 90% comes into play. And to Terry Fox, I know you he can hear me, I say thank you for all you did for me and for others to make the world a better place. Thank you for giving people like me hope. Terry left a legacy in this world. It's tough to beat. But my challenge to you is what will your legacy be? Thank you for listening to my story today. Seven to the 